part of the insidiousness of white supremacy is that it takes empirical statements and turns them into ideological ones. So you and I say the Civil War was fought over slavery and slavery was the cause of the Civil War. Somebody can come to me and I've experienced this. Somebody's like, man, Clint, like you're trying to indoctrinate students with your ideological views, with your politics. And I'm like, that statement's not a political one. It's an empirical one. It's one that's based on evidence, right? Like, but that's part of how racism and white supremacy attempts to sort of twist history and make you feel as if saying something that is true is reflective of a certain type of politic rather than history. Understanding our history is essential to the progress of our community, but history isn't always interpreted with neutrality. The way we talk about and even celebrate aspects of history can indicate how we feel about what has happened and what we hope to happen in the future. So what do you do when those in power deny your history even exists? What happens when the truth is erased? I'm Jay from Push Black, and today on Black History Year, we're talking about how America is or is failing to reckon with the history of slavery. To guide the conversation, we have the incredible Clint Smith joining us. Clint is an essayist, author, and award-winning poet, lauded for his 2016 collection of poetry, Counting Descent. He's a staff writer at The Atlantic who recently wrote his debut nonfiction book titled How the Word is Passed, A Reckoning with the History of Slavery Across America, hitting stores this June. Be sure to check that out. In his research for his book, Clint traveled across the U.S. South and overseas, visiting various monuments, plantations, and statues to answer one all-too-important question. How is or isn't this nation reckoning with the history of slavery? And what does that mean for Black America? He'll be sharing his learnings ahead. This is a conversation you cannot afford to miss, folks. It strikes at the heart of what we do at Push Black and opens the door up for what we can do as a people living in an America that's still grappling with slavery. What does Black liberation mean to you? It means that we all have a deep and profound understanding of what brought us here, of the history that has created the contemporary landscape of our society, that we have a strong sense of everything that has been done to us and that we have done to overcome it. And ultimately, that we are able to build and live in a world that is not predicated on, that is not entangled in any form of systemic oppression in which we just get to be. We get to be in the way that other people get to be and just live in the ways that other groups of people just get to live without the weight of that history being a sort of omnipresent force on our backs. So tell us about how your work contributes to getting us closer to that vision that you have of Black liberation. I recently wrote a book that will be out on June 1st uh, called How the Word is Passed. And the book is a, a nonfiction book that explores how different places across the country reckon with or fail to reckon with their relationship to the history of slavery. And so in it, I go to different places across the country, plantations, prisons, monuments, memorials, houses, cities, neighborhoods, and try to understand to what extent are they confronting their relationship to this history? To what extent are they running from it? And to what extent are they doing something in between? For example, one of the places that I go is Angola prison. And Angola is the largest maximum security prison in the country. It is built on top of a former plantation. 75% of the people held there are Black men. Over 70% of them are serving life sentences. And like I said, it, it's built on top of, of what used to be a plantation. And what I tell folks is that if you were to go to Germany and you had the largest maximum security prison in Germany, and it was built on top of a former concentration camp, in which the vast majority of people held there were Jewish, that place would be a global emblem of anti-Semitism. It would be abhorrent, it would be disgusting. We would never allow 
a place like that to exist. People will be protesting outside of it every single day if it did exist, and rightfully so. Like we, it runs counter to every notion of justice and, and morality and ethics that we purport to believe in. And yet here in the United States, we have the largest maximum security prison in the country in which the vast majority of the people held there are black men serving life sentences who go out into fields of what used to be a plantation and pick crops and plow the fields while someone watches over them on horseback with a rifle over their shoulder as they work for virtually no pay. And so part of what I'm thinking about when I go to a place like Angola is what are the ways that white supremacy not only enacts violence against our bodies, but also collectively numbs us to certain types of violences that should otherwise be wildly unacceptable. I go to Monticello and Monticello, as many people know, is where Thomas Jefferson lived. And I go there to try to understand how you tell the story of Jefferson and how you tell the story of Monticello while not obfuscating or not ignoring or not running past the part of his resume, so to speak, that is too often passed over in our sort of collective educations of who Jefferson was, which is to say he was a slave owner. He was an enslaver. You know, he is someone who wrote one of the most important documents in the history of the Western world, the Declaration of Independence. And he is also someone who enslaved over 600 people over the course of his lifetime, including four of his own children that he had by an enslaved woman named Sally Hemings. He is someone who wrote in one document that all men are created equal in the Declaration of Independence, and then wrote in another document, his book, Notes on the State of Virginia, that Blacks were inferior to whites, quote, in endowments of both body and mind, right? That he didn't believe that slaves were capable of love. He didn't believe they were capable of possessing or sustaining complex emotion. Talked about Phyllis Wheatley, the first published African-American woman poet in the history of this country, said that her work was, quote, below the dignity of criticism wasn't even worth engaging with because Black people didn't possess the emotional or artistic or intellectual capacity with which to create art because they, they couldn't transcend to the emotional capacity in which they could hold and experience love. And he said that love was necessary to create poetry. And so he was like, we can call it something else, but we can't call it poetry because Black people can't engage with or sustain such a, a complex emotional register. And I think about that, I think about how that's a version of Jefferson that I was never taught. And I'm thinking about how Jefferson is in so many ways a microcosm of this country in which we are often so committed to the idea of American exceptionalism that we suppress stories that make us look unexceptional. And we don't we think about the fact that the United States is a country that has provided unprecedented opportunity for millions of people to achieve upward mobility in ways that their ancestors could have never imagined. And that it has done so at the direct expense of millions and millions of other people. And that both of those things are the story of this country. Both of those things are America in the same way that Jefferson was very smart and he was also deeply racist, right? And like, what does it mean to hold both of those things at once? And how does an institution like Monticello talk about the totality of who Jefferson was? And how do they center the lives of the people who lived there who were not Jefferson, right? The hundreds of enslaved people in many ways, that land is more their land than it is his. You know, Jefferson was away in Paris, in Philadelphia, in DC, for much of his life as a public servant in various capacities. And so the people who tended to that land, who built that land, who made memories on that land, they were the enslaved families who lived there across generations. And so as an institution, as a place, how present are they in the narrative that you create about what that place is? But those are two examples of the places I go. Uh, I go to uh, six other places across the country and then one across the ocean. And you know what I'm trying to do is to try to understand how this country is reckoning with that history and how is our country willing to or failing to confront and subsequently make amends for that history in different places throughout the states. So now that you've done the book and been to all these places, do you have a clear understanding of how these places are reckoning or failing to do so? It's a patchwork, you know, it just, it depends. you got a place like the Whitney Plantation, uh, which is another place I go, which is, you know, one of the only, it is the only plantation in Louisiana and one of the only plantations in the country that specifically centers the lives of enslaved people as part of its sort of museum experience. And 
it is interesting because it is surrounded by this larger constellation of plantations where people still have weddings, where people are taking selfies in front of slave cabins that serve as bridal suites, where people are you know, celebrating these monumental, joyful moments in their life inside the homes of former enslavers. The Whitney fundamentally rejects the idea that a plantation is, can be, or should ever be memorialized as something other than a site of torture, right? Like that is what plantations were. They were torture sites in which Black people's bodies were exploited over the course of generations and in which their enslavers innovated through the confluence of capitalism and, and racism, um, figured out different ways to innovate how to most effectively torture their human property in order to extract as much profit as they could. Like that is what plantations were. And, and the Whitney centers that story in a way that is, is, is profound, especially relative to the other plantations that surround it. So that's a place, you know, that is making an attempt to do something and to confront that history in an, like an incredibly intentional way. You have other places though, like I went to the uh, Blandford Cemetery in Petersburg, Virginia. And it's one of the largest Confederate cemeteries in the country. And it's where the remains of 30,000 Confederate soldiers are buried. And I went there during the Sons of Confederate Veterans Memorial Day celebration because I had been to the Whitney. This was in many ways the sort of thing that was 180 degrees uh, apart from that experience. I wanted to understand the sort of contemporary manifestation of the lost cause, right? This idea th that there are people now who would suggest that the Civil War was fought for something other than slavery, right? Like the premises of the lost cause or the idea that the Civil War wasn't actually about slavery. They don't even call it the Civil War. They call it the War of Northern Aggression or the War Between the States. They rejected it was about slavery, but they're like, oh, but even like slavery wasn't that bad anyway, right? It was, um, it's part of a sort of larger tradition of, of scholars who talk about how slavery was a, a, a civilizing institution, something that was, as John Calhoun would say, uh, a, a positive good for white and black members of society. And I go there and I'm having these conversations with these neo-Confederates and trying to understand how people can experience this piece of land in ways that are so profoundly different. When I'm standing among the tombstones of Confederate soldiers, for me, I'm standing on the tombstones and on the land of those who fought a war predicated on maintaining and expanding an institution which enslaved my ancestors. And then you have folks who were there for whom it means something fundamentally different, right? For them, it's, it's family, it's lineage, it's, it shapes their own sense of who they are in the world. And it made really clear to me that history for many people is not about empirical evidence. It's not about primary source documents. It's not about, it's not about what actually happened. It's about a story that they can tell themselves that helps to situate themselves and their family and their lineage in a way that allows them to have a, a often skewed, but you know, specific sense of who they and their family are. Um, and anything that threatens that narrative is fundamentally rejected. So, you know, those are two places that are, that kind of represent both ends of the spectrum. And there's a lot of places that are doing something in between. You're essentially, from what you describe at the cemetery, challenging these folks' identity. And I'm interested in, in your opinion, whose job is it to reckon with this? Like if there are people who benefit from maintaining these narratives and those are the people that are the dominant society, those are they're part of the people who are in power. Can we expect them to tell the full story? And are there any other ways that you've seen that done in addition to the Whitney Plantation? I think it looks different for different groups of people, right? People always say, you know, you spent four years writing this book, like, you know, this is what you think about and, and write about and read about. Like, is it overwhelming? Is it exhausting? Is it like, how do you take care of yourself while you're engaging with such emotionally heavy content? And I very much understand where it comes from. And there are certainly times where I have to be mindful of like how I engage or the extent to which I engage. But I also tell people like, for me, 
and I think for a lot of other Black folks, there is something so liberating and so emancipatory to like fully understand your history and to fully understand the forces that have created the society that we live in today because it means that this country can't lie to you anymore, right? I mean, that's, that's part of the entire project of Push Black, right? Is like a recognition that understanding our history and like understanding it deeply better prepares you and better situates you to navigate the world today. I think all the time about this James Baldwin essay uh, in 1963, a, a talk to teachers. It was originally a speech that he gave to a group of New York City teachers and then it became an essay that was published in one of his collections. And in it, he says a lot. It's one of his sort of more underappreciated essays, I think, but it's one that is perhaps my favorite. But in it, he says that the, the job of the teacher, of the Black child, the person who teaches the Black child, and, and here teacher, he's talking literally to teachers, but also using teachers as sort of a metonym for the larger society. He's like, our job is to help the Black child understand that even though the world will call them criminal over and over again and say that that child is criminal, our job is to help that child understand that they are not in fact criminal, that it is the society that created the conditions that that child is forced to grow up in that is in fact criminal, right? And it's like very simple. And for many of us, it's very intuitive, but it really flips so much on its head that is sort of entangled and related to the way that we are taught, you know, taught about ourselves now. I mean, I think about me growing up in New Orleans at a time when, you know, we were called the murder capital of the nation. We were told, you know, more people go to prison from New Orleans and from Louisiana per capita than like China and Iran and Russia, and these authoritarian regimes and, and sort of implicit within people saying New Orleans is like black people in New Orleans. When people would say New Orleans, we, everybody knew who they were talking about in this you know, majority black city. And when you get the sociological tools, the historical tools and equip yourself with it, equip yourself with this history, I think it, for me, it is like very freeing because I don't experience the emotional and sort of psychological paralysis that I felt when I was a kid where you have all the whole world telling you all these things about the people in your city or the people who look like you and other black people. And you don't have necessarily the language or the toolkit with which to push back against it, not even externally, but like internally within yourself. And I think what happens is that a lot of young people can internalize certain messages. And I know this because I was a high school English teacher and I still continue to teach in jails and prisons and work with a lot of young people who have internalized this. But like, if you don't give a young person the tools to effectively understand their history, both in a micro sense in their community and in a macro sense on like a, you know, a, a national and a global scale, then they internalize what this world is telling them. And so I think that there's a lot of value for us as, as black folks engaging with and learning this history. And that's part of why I love Push Black so much. And then on the other end, you know, it is obviously essential. And, you know, to come back to Baldwin, like he talks about this all the time. He's like, this is work that y'all have to do, white people, right? Like he's like, even the notion of your whiteness is made up and it was constructed in order to create, enforce and maintain power and maintain hierarchies. And there is work that you all have to do to unlearn so much of that. And I think I saw when I was at Blanford, when I was at this Confederate cemetery, I saw, again, the sort of like the furthest end of the spectrum of that, where you had people who, who are simply unable to accept the reality, right? The empirical facts that their ancestors fought a war to keep other humans in chains, right? And so they, they make something up afterwards, this 19th century gaslighting. You have Alexander Stevens, who was the vice president of the Confederacy, who in 1861 in his infamous cornerstone speech said, in essence, that our country is founded on the inferiority of the African and the effort to perpetuate human bondage, that those are the cornerstone of our new nation, right? Like that is the essence of what he said. And then after the war ended and they lost, he went back and he was like, oh no, I never said that. I'm like, what are you talking about? And everybody's like, fam, you said it, we were all there. And so I think that continues to this day. And you have people who, you know, as one guy said, he's like, you're asking me to accept that my great, great grandfather was a monster. 
And I'm like, I'm, I don't care about the interiority of your great, great grandfather's consciousness. It doesn't really matter to me if he was a monster or not a monster, but it does matter to me that you recognize that he fought for a monstrous cause and that you let go of the belief that somehow something they did is something that you have to remain entangled with and have to lie about in order to maintain a sense of who you are and who your children are and who your parents are. That like great, great granddaddy on the mantelpiece very much was part of something that was attempting to keep millions of people in chains. And you have to do the work to accept that. Um, and, you know, there are some who have, and there are many who haven't. What was that like when you went to that cemetery and you met with these neo-Confederates? I'm just interested if you could set the scene for us. Yeah. One of the things that I love about writing this sort of book is that you you really don't know where it's going to take you like you start the book and you think you know you write your whole proposal and you're like i'm gonna go to this place and this place and this place and i'm gonna write about this and this and this and you start and the journey is created for you in many ways so so i say that because you know i went to i never intentionally thought that i was going to go to a confederate cemetery that wasn't something that was on my radar at all but i was interested in like civil war battlefields and so I was like, oh, I'm going to do a chapter on like Civil War battlefields and some big, you know, consequential ones. Maybe I'll, you know, go to Gettysburg or maybe I'll go to Antietam. Maybe I'll go to all these different places. And I went to Petersburg and went to Manassas and I was getting a tour of this Confederate battlefield. And after the tour, one of the tour guides there was like, oh, I was telling them about my project. And he was like, oh, you should go to, uh, you should go to this Confederate cemetery about 10 minutes down the road, the Blanford Cemetery. And I was like, the Blanford Cemetery, I never heard of that. And so I went right after this and I initially went on this tour. It was this church tour. And there's this chapel on the land and you go in there and you get this tour of the chapel. And it's these beautiful stained glass windows with these saints inside of them. The chapel feels so, you know, it's just, it has this sort of this sanctity is like imbued in, in the sort of entirety of the space. And, and you're getting this tour and they're describing these windows in such thorough, intimate and historical detail, but don't say anything about the fact that this church was built and these windows were built specifically to honor Confederate soldiers, right? And at the bottoms of these windows are inscriptions that say, literally, I mean, they say like, in honor of those who fought valiantly for the cause of freedom. And the freedom they mean is, is Confederate secession, right? And the idea that Confederates would secede from the Union and maintain and expand the institution of slavery. And so I thought that, that was curious that we were talking about these windows and not at all talking about why these windows were built or like what the inscription at the bottom of the windows was saying. And I started having a conversation with those folks there. And when I was there, I was at the visitor center. I saw some flyers on the uh, table and this woman saw me look down, this white woman. And it, when she saw me look down, she like threw her hand on the table and, and was like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, don't look at this, don't look at this. And I was like, what is she trying to cover up? And I saw between her fingers that it was a flyer for a Memorial Day event that was about three weeks later hosted by the Sons of Confederate Veterans. And I was like, well, you know, now I have to go see what this is because my, my curiosity had been piqued. And so I went, but my wife was like, uh, you're not going down there by yourself. You need, to, you need to bring somebody else. And so I brought my homeboy, William, who's uh, uh, somebody we both went to school with. And he is white, white graduate student and doing his own, it was, has been on sort of his own journey of uh, reckoning with the fact that his ancestors fought for the Confederacy and owned enslaved people. And so he came with me and we were there. And as you can imagine, at a Sons of Confederate Veterans event, I was very conspicuous. It, it was a sea of white faces, um, a couple hundred people. And the guy gets up there, um, the guy who's the former commander in chief of the Sons of Confederate Veterans, a guy named Paul Gramley. And he gets up there and he's saying all this stuff. And this is in the sort of heat of, this is two years ago and um, in another uh, sort of wave of, of controversy around Confederate statues, Confederate monuments. He got up there and amid a bunch of stuff, he said that anybody trying to take down Confederate statues is the American ISIS, 
right? They're no better than ISIS in the Middle East. That's the American ISIS, and we should treat them the same way. And then people in the crowd are cheering, and they're saying, yeah, yeah. And I'm standing in the back, you know, taking notes, and people are obviously taking note of me, and people start taking their phones out, people start um, recording me, you know, uh, taking pictures of me. So I'm sure I'm on some neo-Confederate message boards and chat rooms somewhere. Um, and that was deeply unsettling and very uh, unnerving. But I was there and I was like, well, let me go try to have some conversations. I just went up to people. I, I just put my journalism hat on and just went and tried to ask some strangers some questions. And I was all, I was not operating in like an antagonistic stance, right? Like I wasn't going there to be like, you're wrong, you're wrong. That's not true. That's not true. I, I really wanted to hear what they thought. Uh, if I think I, if I had approached them from a space of antagonism, I don't think they would have told me the truth or what they believe is the truth. So I, you know, some people have been saying how, how generous I am with this group of people. You know, I, I appreciate that, but I just wanted to hear, I, I didn't want my voice to get in the way of their voices, right? Like, I think some of the most damning stuff that they can say is just them allowing them to talk. And I don't need to interject myself necessarily because they sort of indict themselves. And so it was a wild experience. It was uh, an illuminating experience and it was a clarifying experience. I learned a lot about why we are where we are. And it was just a profound reminder of the way that history is a story. History is a story that people tell and your commitment to a certain story is not necessarily related to whether or not that story is true. To specifically call back to your James Baldwin quote, calling out white folks, what type of work should be done on an institutional or systemic level? And to bring it to our community, what type of work could or should black people be doing around these things? Yeah, I, I think that one of the most important things we can do is make sure that in our K-12 classrooms, we are one, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm empathetic to teachers because I've been a teacher and I know how hard it is. I know how much stress there is. I know how little support there often is. So I think part of this begins by supporting our educators and giving them the training and the tools with which to effectively teach this history, right? So often as a teacher, you're like out here on your own trying to figure it out, just Googling different stuff. I think it's going to take intentional investment in the professional development and training of folks because otherwise people end up teaching what they were taught, regardless of if it's right or not, are teaching in the way that they've been taught. Um, and that's no fault of their own. People got lives and families and are teaching hundreds of kids and, and now living through a, a global plague. So I think you really have to invest in teachers and you really have to give them the tools with which to be successful. And I think we have to, even before that, like part of the insidiousness of white supremacy is that it takes empirical statements and turns them into ideological ones, right? So, so you and I say the Civil War was fought over slavery and slavery was the cause of the Civil War. Somebody can come to me and I've experienced this. Somebody's like, man, Clint, like you're trying to indoctrinate students with your ideological views. You're trying to like with your, with your politics. And I'm like, that, that statement's not a political one. It's, it's an empirical one. It's one that's based on evidence, right? Like, but that's part of how Racism and white supremacy attempts to sort of twist history and make you feel as if saying something that is true is reflective of uh, a certain type of politic rather than history. And so I think we have to work to reject that on a more holistic scale. Some people say we need like a truth and reconciliation committee in the vein of what happened in South Africa. I mean, I think if you talk to a lot of South African folks and a lot of South African activists, they are deeply unhappy with what the Truth and Reconciliation Committee was and what it did. But like, think about what it would mean for the United States to say, this was done in our name. 250 years of slavery, 100 years of Jim Crow apartheid. You know, and I always give this timeline because I think it's really important to sort of ground the conversation. The first, the first enslaved people came to the British colonies that would become the United States in 1619. The Emancipation Proclamation was signed in 1863. Civil War ended in 1865. Civil Rights Act and Voting Rights Act were signed in 1964 and 1965, and the Federal Housing Act was signed in 1968. So it's only been about 50 years in which Black people have even had a semblance of legal and legislative freedom. 
For 350 years prior to that, it was fundamentally legal to discriminate against, dehumanize, delegitimize, disenfranchise Black people. Not an interpersonal, somebody being mean and using a racial slur, but like you are a state-sanctioned, second-class citizen if you're to be considered a citizen at all. So if you kick somebody for 350 years and then ostensibly stop kicking them for a seventh of the amount of time that you spent kicking them, it would be both morally and intellectually disingenuous to then look at that group of people and be like, what's wrong with you? Why don't you have the same educational outcomes? Why don't you have the same uh, economic outcomes? Why is there so much violence, poverty saturating your community? One would know the answers to these questions. But like, that's not a conversation that is happening nationally. It's happening in, in pockets. It's happening in certain spaces, in certain communities, in certain schools. But there needs to be an incentive from the top. The federal government must account for the harm that has been done and create a roadmap of what it looks like to move forward. And I think part of that is the specific resources allocated to Black folks to the extent possible make a specific amends for harm that was, has been done. And people have lots of different ideas and conceptions of what that looks like. But also, you can't underestimate and undervalue the importance of also just like making sure that certain things are taught to young people growing up so that we all are operating with the same foundation of truth and the same foundation of knowledge. Because right now you have a lot of different people who have a lot of different conceptions of like what is true, what is not, what was the civil war about, what, about, what was it not, how did Jim Crow impact people, how did it not, you know. We need to provide something that gets us all on the same page. You know, there's a lot of different ways that, that could look. And, and maybe we'll see this with HR 40, but, but we'll see. So you mentioned teaching folks from a young age. Say more about that. Why is it important to start young? My writing and my work generally is animated by having grown up feeling that sense of paralysis, really, that sense of sort of emotional and psychological paralysis I, I mentioned before, and wishing that somebody had given me the language to understand everything that I was seeing. Wishing that somebody had talked to me about the history of housing discrimination so that when I'm driving around New Orleans, I understand why different communities look the way that they do and don't fall into the trap of thinking that the reason one community looks like it does and another community looks like it does is somehow because of how hard the people in that community did or didn't work, right? I wish that somebody had told me about who Robert E. Lee was when I was driving down Robert E. Lee Boulevard every day to get to school or driving past the 60 foot tall pedestal of Robert E. Lee to get to the grocery store. Having the language, having the tools, having the know-how to better understand why the world I was living in looks the way that it does is so important for a young person because otherwise you just start to make assumptions, right? And it is much harder to unlearn things that you internalize as a child than it is to grow up being given information that helps you more effectively make sense of everything that you see. And some people are like, oh, you know, you don't wanna overwhelm young people with too much information about like our oppression and this and that. And it's like, of course, you gotta scaffold it. You gotta be thoughtful about how you present it. You know, you have to be mindful of it in the same way that you're mindful of what movies they watch in the same way that you're mindful of what foods are they, I mean, like that's, that's what it means to, to raise young people is you're always mindful of how they are consuming certain things. But it doesn't mean that you fail to engage with it at all. Because I feel like I experienced the part of what happens when you don't have that toolkit and you don't necessarily have that know-how and that knowledge base. And I think, you know, as an important it is for, for Black kids to have that, to have that sense of, uh, of know-how, of liberation, of, of that emancipatory feeling, like I mentioned. It's as important, if not more important, for white kids and, and all non-Black folks to also be operating with the same information because it's almost more harmful if you got, you know, millions of white kids growing up thinking that, you know, the reason that Black people writ large live in the conditions that they do is because they just, you know, they didn't work hard enough or they have, you know, they're just predisposed to this or they're more likely to do that. It is essential that everyone understands that the reason the world, the reason that our country looks the way that it does right now, is not by accident. The reason our police force operates the way that it does is not by accident. The, the reason our prisons operate the way that they do is not by accident. The reasons certain people live in certain communities that are afforded certain resources 
and other people live in other communities that seem to have more or less of those resources. It's not by accident, right? Like, and the study of history, I deeply believe, helps you make sense of and understand why our society looks the way that it does. And that's not to say people don't have agency. That's not to say people don't have free will, that people can't make decisions for themselves in their lives that are not singularly governed by those forces. But it is to say it's important for us to all understand and be honest about how agency is shaped and animated by those forces. And that you can have two kids, you know, two fifth grade kids who work equally as hard and give equally as much effort to their schoolwork, to their academics, but who grow up in fundamentally different set of circumstances, which allow for that hard work to manifest itself in, in fundamentally different ways. And that's something we have to be honest about, right? Because otherwise people fall back on like, oh, you, this person worked hard and this person didn't and don't account for the generations of things that have preceded their lives that shape what the outcomes of that hard work will or won't look like. You know, when I think about the work that you've done with this book, it seems like this has the potential to put in motion a new paradigm shift. And I say that just knowing how from our work at Push Black, narrative change can work and it usually takes about 20 years, which is about the same length of a, a generation. So I could see it being super powerful to have this type of information in schools, in the school system, and have a generation of kids growing up understanding the truth about what's going on. And I could see a, a much different future for white and black kids learning about these things in certain ways. Do you have any plans or intents to actively try to get some form of this in schools? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, you write a book and you, you know, you hope a lot of people read it. And so I am, I'm hopeful. I really want to do everything I can to get this in the hands of teachers um, and educators. And, you know, as it's the old Toni Morrison adage, you know, if there's a book that you want to read and it hasn't been written yet, then you need to write it. And that's what I've tried to do, right? And it, this book is born out of my experience growing up a Black child in the beautiful city in New Orleans, in which there was more iconography to enslavers than there were enslaved people, in which I grew up in the shadow of statues of the Confederacy. It is also born out of growing up in a Black family that made me feel loved, affirmed, and celebrated every day. It is also born out of having been a high school teacher and having seen everything that our young people are up against and how school is certainly is not a panacea. Education is not going to solve everything, but that can be one tool in the toolkit with which to push back against so much of what folks in our communities are having to deal with every single day. I hope that my book can be one contribution to like a, a vast and deeply important body of work that our folks have been been writing into for, for generations, as far back as Douglas, as far back as Harriet Jacobs, as far back as we've been here. And so I just wanted to add my voice to that chorus. And what happens with it is, is not up to me. You know, it's, I think as a writer, you kind of, you spend all these years writing something and then you put it out in the world and cross your fingers. So I'm hopeful that it'll find a, find an audience, but even if it didn't, it's been like a deeply, important project for me to undertake for myself. Absolutely. Absolutely. I want to talk about liberation. What can we learn about Black liberation from Emancipation Park and its significance to Juneteenth? Emancipation Park is a really beautiful place that is one of the oldest parts of land in this country that was built and created specifically to allow Black folks to, to celebrate their freedom. And it was built by formerly enslaved folks in Texas who were building a new life for themselves, who were, who were literally building something that they had never known, right? Like their parents had been enslaved, their parents had been enslaved, their parents had been enslaved for generations. And so it was this amazing radical act of imagining and building out of, out of nothing what this future would be and continues to be a, a space of celebrating Juneteenth today. And, and it's a place that has experienced ebbs and flows, that has been built and, and broken down and rebuilt and reimagined in new ways. But it's a powerful, powerful place where folks can come and celebrate Black freedom and Black liberation, but also remember how precarious that, that freedom and liberation are and have been. Yeah, you know, this makes me 
wonder if one way to counter these monuments of white suppression is more monuments of black liberation. What are your thoughts on that? It's an interesting thing. I'm fascinated by monuments. And I think, you know, we're having obviously a large conversation right now about what monuments should stay up and what monuments should they stay down. I mean, the essence of it for me is that like, I think Confederate statues and monuments are the sort of low hanging fruit of this debate. Like those should just, they should come down. They not, don't put a plaque on them. Don't rename it. If it's a statue of Robert E. Lee, you take it down. It's a statue of Jefferson Davis, you take it down. All these folks, and you can put them in a museum. You can put them in a place that is not public property in which taxpayers are funding them remaining up on these pedestals of reverence. They are an institution that fought a war that was predicated on maintaining and expanding the institution of slavery. And they were treasonous to, to the federal government. So that for me is simple. I think that people of good faith can have different ideas and conceptions about what should be done with a range of other different monuments. But generally I'm interested in trying to move away from monuments to like single individuals that operate in almost sort of like idolistic ways and more interested in monuments to collectives of groups of people like the monument in Washington DC by U Street, which is a monument to the hundreds of thousands of black soldiers who fought for the Union in the Civil War or the monument in Boston to the 54th Massachusetts Infantry, which was the black, which were the black troops during the Civil War who are celebrated in the movie Glory with Denzel Washington and whose work also fundamentally transformed millions of people's understandings and conceptions of like what black folks were capable of in war and, and their notions of them being worthy of citizenship. And it's, you know, it's not to say we should, you know, the asterisk there is that black folks don't need to fight in a war to be worthy of citizenship, but it was a deeply important moment in the context of, of the American Civil War. But like thinking of mon monuments and memorials, not only to our past, but also to like our future. Like what is it, what, what is a monument to black liberation the aspiration of black liberation looked like, right? Like what, it, what would it mean to drive past places that helped us move toward what we are sort of collectively trying to go towards instead of only having things that remind us of where we've been. And to be clear, like having those monuments, um, as someone who just wrote a, a book of history over the course of the past several years, having those monuments that remind us where we've been are deeply important. But I also think there's room to imagine monuments that represent ideas and aspirations and goals and notions of justice and liberation and possibility that serve as, as guideposts and almost North Stars for us that I think can be equally as important as those things that go up in order to remind us of where we've been. We need to be reminded of where we're trying to go. My brother, I appreciate your time today, man. Is there anything that you want to give to our community related to the work that you've done or that you're going to do? I hope everyone considers getting a copy of the book. And I also encourage folks to, you know, the last chapter of my book is a conversation that I have with my grandparents and uh, my grandfather who was born and raised in 1930, Jim Crow, Mississippi. My grandmother, who was raised in 1939, Jim Crow, born and raised in 1939, Jim Crow, Florida, and sitting down and having that conversation with them about their lives and, and what they've experienced was so important to me. It helped one sort of ground me in both their and subsequently my proximity to the history of, of slavery, right? Where like their grandparents, my grandmother's grandfather was born right after emancipation and my grandfather's grandfather was born in bondage. And so I'm, you know, in those moments, I'm reminded that this history that we tell ourselves was a long time ago wasn't in fact that long ago at all. You know, the woman who rang the bell to open the National Museum of African American History and Culture alongside the Obama family in 2015, she was the daughter of an enslaved man, right? Like her father, someone who was still alive in 2015, had been born into slavery. And so like there are people who are still alive who were raised by, who loved, who had relationships with people who were born into bondage. And that's important for us to remember. And I would encourage folks to sit down with their elders and have these conversations and just like interview them and have these conversations. I learned so much from interviewing my grandparents and now I'll have that, that audio recording forever. We don't know how much longer our elders will be with us at any point and life feels especially precarious these days. So one thing that, you know, if I had done nothing else for the book, doing that would have been enough. And it's something that so many of us can do. 
and I highly, highly recommend it. Be sure to pick up Clint Smith's must read book, How the World is Past, A Reckoning with the History of Slavery Across America, available June 1st. And just like that, we're at the end of this episode of Black History Year. This podcast is produced by Push Black, the nation's largest nonprofit black media company. At Push Black, we agree with Marcus Garvey when he said, a people without knowledge of their past history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. And I'm guessing you probably feel like that's important too. I mean, here you are at the end of a podcast about black history. You matter. Your choice to be here matters. It lets us know that you value this work. Push Black exists because we saw we had to take matters into our own hands. You make Push Black happen with your contributions at blackhistoryyear.com. Most folks do five or 10 bucks a month, but everything makes a difference. Thanks for supporting the work. The Black History Year production team includes Tarek Alani, Patrick Sanders, Albany Jones, William Anderson, Jerea Bradley, Brooke Brown, Shonda Buchanan, Brianna Lambach, Courtney Morgan, Aquia Tay, Tasha Taylor, Leslie Taylor Grover, and Darren Wallace. Producing and editing the podcast, we have Sydney Smith and Ivana Tucker. Julian Walker is the executive producer of the podcast. And I'm Jay from Push Black. Thanks for checking us out.